Hi, I'm Chin Lu. And I'm Sal, and this is our next make. We're back in the shop again to do some final projects on the table saw. Today we're going to upgrade the power switch, swap out the drive belt, and then answer an important question from one of our viewers. Let's get started. To upgrade the table saw switch, I'm going to go with a product like this, where there's a small power button and then a giant uh, paddle for turning the machine off. It's great for safety, you don't have to look for the off button. And I bought this initially because it was a turnkey solution, it's got all the cables that you need uh, and you can just plug and play. But what I learned is this is more appropriate for something like a router table. It could work with my table saw, don't get me wrong, but I'd end up with a lot more wires than I'd want to deal with. So I'm going to keep this for a future project and focus on this other product that I brought, which is very similar. It's got the large paddle and on-off button, and uh, it doesn't have any of the other guts. So I can just uh, focus on swapping out my existing switch with this one. This is a simple electrical project, but if you're uncomfortable with this kind of work, please consult an electrician. And before starting any electrical work like this, make sure the tool is unplugged. Now you can safely unscrew the old switch and remove it from the box. On the back, you'll see four screws that you can loosen to free the wires. If we take a look at the back of the new switch, we'll see four screw terminals as well. But most importantly, we'll see the labels of line and load. The line side is for the wires that carry power from the wall outlet to the switch, and the load terminals are for the wires that connect the switch to the motor. To make sure I'm connecting the wires to the correct terminals, I temporarily plug in the saw and test the connections. The wires to the motor will not light up the bulb, but the wires to the wall will. After unplugging the saw again, I'll connect those wires to the line terminals. Your switch should come with a wiring diagram that you can also use as reference. Before I connect things though, I'll remove the front cover to make installing the wires a bit easier. Now I can connect the four wires to the appropriate terminals and then carefully place the switch back into the box. Okay, I ran into a little bit of a problem. The hole spacing in the switch does not match the hole spacing in my switch box. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, I, I paid attention when I bought these things to make sure that the outer housing fit exactly. I thought that uh, that would be enough. Uh, and even though they do match, the hole spacing is different. So I'm gonna have to figure something out. And I've got a couple choices as always. I could go back to this original idea of using this product uh, and making it work. But as I said earlier, it's gonna result in a bunch of uh, you know spaghetti underneath my table saw and I'm not interested in that. I suppose I could um, take these wires out and wire in the existing uh, wiring for my table saw and make that work. And that would probably uh, be a good solution. But if I'm gonna modify a product and potentially void its warranty, uh, I might as well figure out how to make this one work because this is the one I really wanna make work. Um, and I think I have a simple solution. Uh, I'm just going to drill another hole in this plastic housing. And then I do have to modify this little metal bracket here a little bit and just cut out a small detail. Um, I will say, of course, at this point, um, if you're watching along and looking for inspiration, we are in void warranty territory. We are in try this at your own risk territory. Uh, I'm confident that the modifications for my preferences are small and simple enough that they're not gonna cause any safety issues. Uh, but it is something you should be aware of. When you start to do this kind of thing with a commercially available product, all bets are off. Again, I'm making very simple modifications, not changing any of the electrical uh, features. So I feel comfortable with this, but again, if you're gonna do something like this, do it at your own risk. To drill the new hole, I first taped the old and new switch covers together. That way I could use the hole position in the old cover to locate the new hole as I drilled it on my drill press. To cut the relief notch in the metal, I used the cutoff wheel on my Dremel to grind away a small amount. Now we can check that everything fits. I'll place one screw in the original hole in the bottom and another in the new hole in the top. And then I'll flip things over to see how the metal bracket fits. You can see that the bottom hole lines up nicely and the notch in the top works as well. Before mounting the cover plate, I'll place a small piece of electrical tape over both holes and then poke the screw through the upper hole. I can finally reattach the cover plate and snap on the large stop panel. Okay, moment of truth, let's see if this thing works. Now let's look at the drive belt. I was recently changing the saw blade and noticed that the arbor was slipping as I tried to loosen the nut. Normally, there's enough resistance in the system to allow the nut to break free, but something has changed. Let's take a look at this X-Design model to see how my table saw is set up. The motor is on a hinge that allows it to pivot downward and put tension on the belt. This force, combined with the friction between the belt and the pulleys, is supposed to be enough to properly tension the belt. Since the arbor is now spinning, I assumed that the belt had either stretched over time or become too smooth to do its job. To confirm my suspicion, I squeezed the belt while trying to loosen the nut. The extra tension held the arbor in place and I could easily swap the blade. So I ordered a replacement and got started removing the old belt. I simply loosened the wind nut to remove the protective shroud and then lifted up on the motor to remove the old belt from the front and rear pulleys. When the new belt arrived, 
I was a bit surprised to see it look so different than the original belt, but then it dawned on me that belt technology has likely evolved over the last 25 years, and this is now the state of the art. So I put the new belt on the pulleys. Okay, the old belt has been replaced, but the new belt has not fixed the problem. When I put a blade on and tighten the nut, the whole system still spins. So Chinlu and I spent the last hour trying to figure out what's going on. We even repositioned the motor to try and create even more tension on the belt, but that didn't fix the problem. And it wasn't until we started to look closer at what was happening at the clamping surfaces here at the arbor, and we noticed that there was a red residue on both of the clamping surfaces. When I started to wipe it off, I realized it was powdered paint. And what was happening is the paint on the blade was being uh, abraded and actually turning into a fine dust. Now this may have been because I didn't tighten it well the very first time I used it, but whatever caused the problem, that's, that powdery surface was creating a slick uh, interface and no matter how hard I tried to clamp, uh, it still could spin when I tried to break it free. So the reality is the belt wasn't slipping, it's just that the whole system was turning and the slipping was happening right at the blade and the clamping surfaces. So I've since cleaned this up um, and when I put it back together, it still slips a little bit. So just to verify that I was on the right track, I took my really old saw blade, which is just raw metal. And when I clamped it on and tightened the nut, it worked perfectly. Uh, the metal to metal surfaces actually um, grab each other well and I can tighten and loosen without issue. So just for added measure, I'm gonna go and sand off the paint in these areas. And again, you probably don't have to do this on a very nice new blade, but because I've started to create a already a slick zone in these areas, I'm gonna take the paint off, get it back down to raw metal, and see, that that, see if that uh, addresses the issue. I use 150 grit sandpaper to remove the bulk of the paint on both sides of the blade, and then sand it again with 60 grit just to further scuff the surfaces to provide better grip. With that done, I replaced the blade and found that tightening and loosening the arbor nut is back to normal. It feels great to finally figure out the solution for this. Yeah, I'm so glad that we were able to realize that it had nothing to do with the belt and everything to do with what was going on with the arbor. And I hope that's a lesson to all of you that if you have a problem, don't immediately jump to solutions like I did and buy replacement parts when you haven't quite figured out where the actual problem is. And in both of our projects this week, it didn't really quite work out the way we expected. But with some ingenuity and persistence, we figured out the solution that worked for both of us. Yeah, I'm happy that these projects are behind us, but I think we have one important question that we should answer from Tony who writes in and asks, are we concerned that the cantilever design of the table saw is actually going to tip over if we have a large heavy object being pushed through it? In order to figure this out, let's first take a quick measurement. Using our bathroom scale and a few boards, we can see how much force it takes to lift up on this side of the table saw. On average, the scale reads around 107 pounds, but since the boards themselves weigh about seven pounds, we'll subtract that from the weight and call it an even 100 pounds. Now we can look at the SOLIDWORKS model and do some simple math to figure out how much force it will take to push down on the other side. We took our measurements 30 inches from the pivot point, but on the outfeed side, we'll only be 24 inches from the pivot point. This means we'll need even more force to start the tipping, 125 pounds to be exact. Conceptually, this feels like a large number because I can't picture myself pushing a 125 pound object through this table saw. But let's take an extreme example, a sheet of 3 quarter inch MDF, which weighs around 100 pounds. That's still less than the 125 pound limit, but it's close enough to cause concern. Let's see what would happen if I cut it in half on the table saw. Notice the yellow center of mass symbol on the MDF. This is the point upon which we could technically balance the entire sheet. If it crosses past the edge of the outfeed table, the whole sheet will start to tip. So in reality, to cut a sheet like this, I'll still need to put a roller stand a few feet away to catch the board before the center of mass crosses the outfeed table. At this point, the 100 pound weight of the sheet will be shared by the table and the roller. So neither the table nor the MDF will tip. With that said though, for added safety, you could consider adding more weight to the base of the table saw or building a set of legs that would catch the table if it started to tip. Based on what we just saw and how we plan on using this table saw, I'm confident that it won't tip. I agree. So let's wrap up with the suggestion from a viewer. When we created this insert, we used a router to create a relief for the existing blade. Tom suggested that we bypass all of that and use a smaller diameter blade. That's right. He suggests that you can just borrow the blade from your circular saw, put it in a table saw, and just raise it to make that cut in one shot. Uh, what's important, of course, is that the kerf on the circular saw blade has to be the same as the kerf on the table saw blade. But as long as that's the case, you can do that, and that's a great tip. So if you have any other tips that you want to share with the audience, please leave those in the comments below. Be sure to join us next week when we'll be making a fun and functional project for the kitchen. Until then, we'll see you on our next make.